Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, this will be a little bit of a change of pace. I like to, to talk about different topics. Uh, I like to speak about things I know a little about, so I like to stick to my own research, and this is part of my own research. But as you can guess from the title, it's going to be a little bit different from maybe what you were expecting, and, and I also do that so that I avoid all the hard questions. <laughs> Uh, obviously, right now, there's a major outbreak of Ebola, but there was an earlier one uh, in 1976. So these pictures were from 1976 and not from the current breakout. At that time, there was a 44-year-old man named Mabalo Lokela who died two weeks after he developed flu-like symptoms. And you know the flu-like symptoms are the first sign. Uh, this was in Zaire, which is in Central Africa. It's a different part of Africa from where the current outbreak is. But the, the cultural norm for a funeral was that the family prepares the body, and then afterward, there's a communal wash basin where everybody washes their hands in a, in a common pool of water. And as you know now, right now, a lot of people know a lot about Ebola. As you know, it spread through the, the, the con direct contact with bodily fluids. So they, they cleaned up the deceased, they washed their hands in a common wash basin, they started spreading Ebola. And at that time, there were only 318 cases, 280 of those people died. The current outbreak, there have been over 13,000 cases, and over 8,000 have died. But at that time, everybody was running scared because of Ebola, the sky was falling. That was a really minor outbreak compared to the current one. It still is very dangerous because of its mortality rate, but it's really not that infectious. If you believe what the CDC says, you have to have direct contact with bodily fluids in order to catch Ebola. Now the same year, and this was familiar to me because I was a, I was a high school student at this time and I lived in Philadelphia, the big news was Legionnaire's disease. It still pops up every now and then. Started at the Bellevue Stratford Hotel. That's it there on the right. They had no idea what caused this. People started getting sick at a convention, the American Legion Convention. That's where it got the name. Uh, I think it was on uh, something like July 29th of, of that year. People started getting symptoms. And they couldn't figure out what was causing it. They were getting very sick. And by August 2nd, so only four days later, the Centers for Disease Control was very worried about this. It hit national news. Uh, word was spreading. People had associated the sickness with the hotel, so they suspected there was something in the infrastructure. And it turns out it was. It was in the ventilation system, the air conditioning cooling units that spray little droplets of water. The, the, the uh, infectious agent was in the little droplets of water. It took them a long time. It took them the better part of a year to figure that out. Uh, this guy here, he was actually one of the epidemiologists that went in to study the spread of the disease. And he recovered, but his peak fever was 107.4 degrees. If you know anything about sickness, that's beyond what's normally considered survivable. I think like 106 is, some, is, is about the, the, the highest norm. So again, it's very dangerous. It's not terribly infectious. You won't get it by shaking hands with somebody, but there have been cases where people have caught <coughs> Legionnaire's disease from a hot tub, and there has been a case where somebody caught Legionnaire's disease from the overspray from their windshield washer fluid. So always use that blue stuff. It's got, it's got alcohol in it. It'll kill the Legionnaire's bacteria. Uh, I was living in Blacksburg, Virginia at the time, and somebody caught Legionnaire's disease from I don't know exactly the name of the store, so I won't impugn a name. It was a big box hardware store where they were selling hot tubs, and they had the bubbler on, and somebody was just walking past the display of hot tubs, inhaled the fumes from the bubbler. SARS, uh, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. This was uh, a little over a decade ago. Uh, this is much more infectious. It's a, it was a little bit less lethal. You had to be pretty sick to die from this. 
but you're beginning to see why I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the spread of diseases. SARS was the first time that the mathematicians started getting involved in the spread of infectious agents. That's part of the model. It started in Hong Kong, and uh, the, the person who carried it, he was actually a, a medical doctor, a physician, came from mainland China. He was going to a conference at this particular hotel. They call it Hotel M. Uh, it was unidentified, but it begins with an M, in Hong Kong. And he stayed on a particular floor in the hotel and used the, he was in the elevator lobby and he sneezed and he touched the button. And eventually 148 people who traversed that same elevator lobby and touched that same button ended up with the SARS disease. So here's a case, it's not quite as lethal, but it's extremely infectious. And this is where I got interested as a cybersecurity professional. Is there an analogy that can be drawn between the spread of infectious agents and the spread of malware? And rather than make this a lecture on malware, I thought, well, I, I, I think I can draw some conclusions that may be useful in your studies if you're studying cybersecurity uh, that relate back to the fundamental math. The reason I got interested in what epidemiologists were doing with disease was that they were developing fundamental mathematics that we could use to study the spread of uh, infectious software. So let's look at that a little bit. The factors that they decided to focus on were the transmissibility, the things I've been talking about. Some diseases are more transmissible than others. Some people are more susceptible than others. Some people are more vigilant than others. And all of these things become variables. Uh, how infectious is the agent? Have you had the appropriate form of contact? Either it's direct contact through bodily fluids, were you in proximity to somebody who sneezed or coughed? Vigilance, did you take protective measure, measures? You saw on the uh, people wearing masks. Along with uh, uh, vigilance comes awareness, the social response. Remember I mentioned that with Legionnaire's disease, People started getting sick on July 29th of 1979. It was on the evening news by August 2nd. That made people aware, and they, well, they didn't know what caused it at the time, but uh, there were not, a lot, were not a lot of whole, not a lot of people hanging out at the hotel bar at the, at the Bellevue Stratford in Philadelphia. So those people didn't get sick. It, it, so that, that accomplished its, its purpose. If you could geographically isolate the, the, the infectious agent, can avoid it. You can do that with malware as well. How much time has passed? How aware are you? Are you uh, vigilance? Are you afraid of getting it? Are you taking measures? Are you staying away from hazardous situations? And of course the recovery rate. Uh, you saw the two nurses that were infected in the hospital in Dallas recently. Uh, they've had news conferences. They're, they have recovered. They're no longer infectious. The faster you recover, the less probability there is for you to continue to spread the disease. And we can take a lesson from that as well. So I started doing a little bit of homework and I found some people, uh, for some reason, I don't know, Indiana team seems to be the hotbed for research in this area. Something about Indiana. They have created mathematical models. This is a probability network where you define a number of variables. And I'm not expecting anybody to follow the math, but uh, Basically, the, the, the concept is that each of the nodes is a state that you can be in. So, if you are a person with a disease, you can be uh, susceptible, but non-vigilant. So that's, that's SR. SA is uh, susceptible and vigilant. And so you can transition from being susceptible and non-vigilant to hearing about this disease and becoming susceptible but vigilant. So then the other, what's, what's important is the kinds of variables that they define. Uh, that's small here, can't read it. Uh, in addition to being susceptible, you can actually be infected. Infected, vigilant, non-vigilant. Uh, did you have the disease and recover from it? Or equivalently, did you have the malware and recover from it? So you probably have the signature installed in your antivirus with you that you didn't have before. Uh, 
and each of the links is a probability of transitioning. If you are susceptible and non-vigilant, is there a probability of transitioning to susceptible and vigilant? You build this graph up. This is actually one of the simpler ones that I could find in the literature. You create a model of the spread of infectious agents. This actually is a model of the spread of malware. But you can go into the medical literature and find the exact same graphs with the exact same variables, and they try to figure out the exact same probabilities. And they create a formal uh, an equation for how, how agents spread. I didn't think anybody actually used this, but I was at the Army Research Lab on Tuesday, and I got a presentation from their uh, supercomputing center. And it takes a, a lot of computing power to run these models. They were actually studying the spread of malware and showing on a map where you would expect things to spread. It depends on how big your networks are and how your internet service provider is connected and where your backbone is connected and so forth. And that, that relates to that contact variable. So everything that you have in, in medical epidemiology, you have in, in the cybersecurity world. So, like all academic papers, at the end, they concluded a lot of interesting things about their, the analysis that, that they performed. And if you care to look up those, those papers, there are some interesting, uh, well, dozens of conclusions. I picked out some of the, the more relevant ones to malware. Uh, central reporting is very important. Uh, in epidemiology, we have the Centers for Disease Control in this country, and you have the World Health Organization internationally. And emergency rooms have to report cases that they see on their radar. If you go into an emergency room with the flu, your flu is reported to the Centers for Disease Control. Everywhere around the country, all of that information is aggregated. Next year, when you get a flu shot, your data was part of the formulary for, that, for next year's flu shot, because they know what strains occurred the previous year. Uh, the World Health Organization does that worldwide. There is no such thing in cybersecurity. I had an opportunity to work with Senator Gillibrand's office when she was drafting a cybersecurity bill for Congress. There have been 13 of them introduced. None of them have passed because people are concerned that central reporting, well, if you're a company, do you want other companies to know that your, your system has been compromised? I don't particularly want people to know that I have an infectious disease either, but there are reasons that that data should be used in a centralized way, and those mathematical models have proven that out. It's very effective in helping prevent the spread of infectious agents if somebody gathers all that data. Remember the other variable, vigilance? Somebody gathers all that data and says, hey, a bunch of American Legionnaires who are getting sick in a hotel in Philadelphia, be careful, wear a mask, do something to make yourself more vigilant. Small groups of users engaging in risky behavior threaten the entire population. Uh, obviously, that's true in cybersecurity. Somebody who is a vector for an attack can result in the spread of infectious agents in an entire land or subnet. That's true with diseases as well. Somebody gets on a plane and doesn't tell the security agent that they've been in West Africa and has the sniffles, one person can spread to an entire continent. Uh, some things I, I took particularly interest in in, uh, in, the, in the malware world. Uh, Patching and recovery should be as easy as possible, even if you have unlicensed copies. There used to be that if you had a bootleg copy of Windows, you didn't get all the patches. Well, Microsoft, suck it up. People have bootleg copies. You're better off distributing free patches to, have, to people who have illegal copies because it makes you less vulnerable overall. Publicity is good, generate a social response. It spreads vigilance, it makes people aware so that they go and they, they update their, their uh, signature files or they'll, they'll install uh, adware blockers or, or refresh, or go to a different uh, antivirus. Accelerate the recovery rate. If you find you've been hacked, well, your chances are you're not working too well on your system. Recover as quickly as possible, it makes you less infectious. And then uh, passive protections are not sufficient. You really need people to be aware of it. A firewall is not enough. That's a passive protection. You need people to actively go out and spread the word. Well, those were lessons learned from medical epidemiology, and they're, they're really valuable in, in cybersecurity. So why am I bringing all this up to you as a group? 
Well, look what, what went into this study. Uh, I think you can see the relevance. This was a research topic of mine. What did I, what did I study when I was doing the research? There was graph theory. There were probability networks. Probability and statistics, those were conditional probabilities interacting with one another, so it got very complicated, ended up with high performance computing problems. That's uh, conditional probabilities in discrete time is one problem. In continuous time, the way the, the medical epidemiologists do it, it's a, a coupled high dimensional differential equation. Well, that's interesting for, for the study of malware, right? Epidemiology itself, bringing in medical professionals, sociology, what the interaction between people is, the economics, what motivates people to, to patch their software. And I, one that I left out that I think is very interesting, politics. Why hasn't there been a successful cybersecurity bill? We can go to medicine and show that there are measures that are very effective, but for privacy concerns and economic concerns, there's a lot of resistance haven't gotten to the point where we can convince the computing community that a central database is, is critical to their operations. It's for the common good. There are a lot of good reasons not to want to report uh, that you've been compromised. But there actually are some systems like the Defense Industrial Base Voluntary Cybersecurity Database. Defense companies can voluntarily opt in when they get attacked or compromised. They share this data in an anonymized form. And it's been shown that that helps prevent attacks. So it's been demonstrated that it works. And all of that can be traced back to this mathematical analysis of susceptibility, vigilance, and recovery rate. So I stumbled across, I hope this works. All right, these are people who are vigilant, right? They got the mask. And there's a small group of people who are going to compromise the whole deal. Uh, but he, he's not taking care, so he spits in the street. <laughs> So no matter what your best intentions are and the protections you take, sometimes you just can't get away from that one person who's going to touch the buttons and cough all over everybody. Are we happy to take questions? Or it's just bad water. See the way she moves aside. The woman standing next to like, like moving it one step aside is going to protect her from it. I don't think they expected that. Uh, <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you.